Good afternoon, folks. Um, a more intimate room this afternoon, which is good, for hopefully better, better discussion. Um, my, my job, uh, I work in the world of creativity and talent development. Uh, at Google, I, it is my responsibility to ensure that we develop cre creativity as a learnable skill in all of our people, 100,000 plus across the globe. I'm also afforded a little bit of time to work with other really ambitious organisations to help coach and advise the leaders there to how they disrupt their own thinking about how they might look at their world slightly differently. But the, the thing that's consistent in all I do is a goal to try and drive creativity to be recognised as much a business critical skill as our technical expertise and our knowledge based um, and our knowledge based skills. The World Economic Forum, uh, their future of job study forecast that creativity will be the, the third most demanded skill in the world of work by 2020. In 2015, it was number 10. Two years before that, it was nowhere near the top 10. I absolutely con concur with this. I'm seeing it every day, as I'm sure many of the panel um, uh, will, will agree. Uh, technology, the role of technology in automation is becoming more pronounced in all of our jobs, and particularly in parts of our roles that are about output, efficiency, accuracy, productivity. So it makes, makes sense that the role and the value that human beings will continue to add in the future will be in our ability to think, to think differently, to challenge the status quo, and to be creative in the way that we approach and think about the challenges and problems we have to develop new ideas and solutions. Uh, the, the private sector agrees. Uh, many organisations do similar studies. Adobe's um, uh, recent study, uh, they found that three out of four people believe that creativity is vital to unlocking economic growth in our organisation, our sector, our, our, our economy. But so here's, here's the big flip to everything I've just said. Only one in four people believe they have the permission or the ability to be creative at work. And that's the big issue here, folks. I think technology, and I'm a massive proponent of technology, but it can be a distraction to what really drives innovation, which is people, which is people. Don't get me wrong, technology, automation, and digitalization is giving us a set of tools that are more powerful than ever before in which to work with, but it is still human beings that innovate. And it is often the lack or the absence of creativity within organizational cultures that is stopping that innovation from happening. A fantastic quote here from Kevin Kelly, the founder of Wired. You know, we're not lacking in knowledge and technology in the world. And where we are, we can actually, Moore's Law, which I'll talk about in a bit more in a, in a second, Moore's Law actually ha enables us to quite accurately forecast when it will be here. So technology isn't the problem, nor is knowledge. It's our imagination of what to do with it. Um, let, me give you, let me give you a story as to the consequence of this. So we go back, basic history. If you're a history expert in the room, you're going to be extremely underwhelmed by the next minute or so. Um, but a story, let's go back to the early 1600s, where many countries, in fact, in the, in the developed world, set up shipping, shipping organisations to go and explore the furthest reaches um, of our known world um, to, to transport precious goods around, around the globe. And one of those, um, one of those goods was spice, was spices. Um, so precious because it helped to preserve food, or at least helped rotten food to taste not so bad. And, um, and if you were in the spice trade, so the spice trade was formed, and people in the spice trade were the wealthiest in the world. Organisations often owned by governments, or what were the, the, the versions of governments back then, they dominated the world, they were market leaders in this spice trade. And so was the case for a long, long time. But fast forward, in this case a few hundred years, and the spice trade's value was wiped out almost overnight. Because somebody really worked out that if you insulated two pieces of wood um, in such a way, you could actually maintain a, a temperature, a constant temperature, in an entire building or indeed a, a, a railway carriage for a prolonged period of time. So the spice trade was wiped out overnight by the ice trade. People cutting ice from coal parts and transferring them to warm parts and being able to maintain them there whilst they, whilst they sold them, them off. The spice trade wiped out and then the ice trade was formed. And again, market leaders in the ice trade. Fast forward a few more years again, the ice trade wiped out overnight because someone realised that if you could create a consistent temperature in a, in a space, well then actually you could make ice on site in that location. 
So guess what? The artificial ice trade was born and the ice trade wiped out. And then we could go on and on, the early forms of refrigeration of ice boxes and then electricity and so on and so on. And here's the interesting thing about that story, and a very basic story, so thank you for going with me. But um, not one of the market leaders in each of the trades went on to be a market leader in the next one, in the next one. And that's the big watch out for us. What history tells us is this. Almost every sector or industry gets disrupted eventually. In fact, I would go so far as to say everyone does. It might not have happened yet, but it will if there is an industry that hasn't been uh, disrupted. At Google, we work on the premise that search will be disrupted. And it might not be us that does it. We do everything we can to try and be in, in that control. But it might be somebody else who has the ability to think differently about it to us. It's happening faster than ever, as I just showed there, the acceleration. And this is where technology is helping to play a fantastic part, or a, or a threat, if you like, if you are one of those incumbents. And rarely is it the incumbent that does the disruptive. And I think that is the big, big watch out and lack of creativity um, in the world. We see it, I'll show those logos because they're the poster children of disruption, but actually it's happening on a smaller scale. It's even happening within organizations where one team or, or, or department is being wiped out by or disrupted by another department that's thinking about that job in a totally or that function in a totally different in a different way. And let me just give you a very very basic um, overview of why I feel this is happening. Um, excuse the the, the basic uh, basic graph, but this is what we do as incumbents. We are brilliant at doing what we already do really well a bit better, a bit better, and that is incremental innovation. Not a problem in isolation. Not a problem in isolation. We should be doing that, the marginal gains of um, incremental innovation. However, there is a watch out. Often we innovate beyond the points that our users or consumers or people that we're, we're, we're targeting can value, can value. I'll give you a quick story from uh, Adidas, and don't mind me telling you this. Adidas have the lightest soccer boots in the world. They always have. Uh, just before the 2016, the Euros, uh, their lightest soccer boot in the world at that point weighed 100 grams. And they were excited to just launch ahead of the Euros, their new soccer boot, the lightest in the world, which weighed 90 grams. My push to them was, how many people are not buying your soccer boots because they're 90, 100 grand, but are gonna go run into the shops to get them because they're 90? And that's the watch out of our incremental innovation from the point of our expertise. But, again, I stress, in isolation, not a problem at all. It's a great place to be. But here's the change. Here's what's changed in the world. Um, disruption, innovation, if you like, um, used to be linear. Used to be linear. Used to work like this. Linear steps. And that meant that as an incumbent, we could afford to be slow. We could take our time. We could watch and monitor um, disruption as it came up upon us in a nice, even pace. And then we could wait. A lot of the time it would fizzle out. But if it didn't, we could acquire, we could partner, we could even copy, if you like, and we could be slow. But because technology is powering so much of innovation in the world, and Moore's Law, just to, in case you aren't familiar with the principle of Moore's Law, Gordon Moore, uh, founder of, um, of Intel, um, predicted that co uh, computer processing power would double every two years, and he's largely been right. So if you do a doubling of 30 steps, you can see the difference if you can see the bottom of the screen there. And, um, and that's the start, start of 30 to over 500 million. Transfer that to a linear graph, and I'm sure you know where this is going. It looks like that. And so what that means is that disruption no longer is something that we can predict or see or be slow, because one day, it doesn't even exist. Facebook will tell you this when, with their acquisition of WhatsApp. Now, it's been a very successful acquisition, but one day, it wasn't even on the radar for many of us. And the next day, it had the ability to wipe out their, orbit, um, their organization. Um, I'll skip on from that, so I can tell you that story later. But, um, but that's the result that we get this disruptive innovation comes along and totally reinvents the way that our industry works, thinks, or that users value what we do. So the push is this, what are we doing to disrupt ourselves? Because I guarantee you if we're not, somebody else, somebody else is. And actually, the, the organizations and industries and sectors, countries even most at risk of being disrupted are the most successful ones. Because of two things, one, because they're least likely to be seeking to do the disruption because they're just harvesting what they're doing brilliantly and, get, and having lots of success. And also, because of that success, there is a good, rich reward 
to the people that are able to disrupt you. Um, just to give you the, uh, the Adidas story, um, they disrupt themselves by using 3D printing. I actually changed the value proposition. If I could sell you a thousand dollar printer today, that you could print a thousand licenses of soccer boots in any color design, etc., for your kids, all of a sudden the value proposition has changed. So just to end, what are you doing to disrupt yourself as a sector, as an industry, as a country, as a nation? What are we doing? Not, to, not taking ourselves for granted. Who can you partner with? Who can you partner with? Here's the big thing. Entrepreneurs aren't often the technological experts, but they know where to find them to make their ideas happen. Uh, what other worlds do you have the ability to, um, to disrupt? If we're being disruptive, this is what, you know, I salute Google here. Google will recognise that we are constantly under threat of disruption, so we're looking to do it ourselves. Make sure we're in control of it. And last but not least, what experiments can you start today? Because that's where creativity is born and happens. And I suppose for those of you that are leaders in organisations and companies, what are you doing to promote that? Thank you.